we are faced with a challenge that is truly existential. And what we need to do will be truly transformational. And if we do this well in Europe, it will have an effect on the rest of the world. Well, well, well let me be very clear. If you look at our impact assessment, and to put it in layman's terms, this is going to be bloody hard to do. It is hard to do. And we will ask sacrifice of everyone. Industry, our citizens, the transport system, etc. It's a tough job, but it can be done. Good afternoon and welcome to the third Eurocommerce Policy Talk, where we engage with senior politicians of the European Union uh, and also we engage with you, all of you, our viewers and listeners, and we're very pleased today that we're reaching a milestone record of uh, close to 300 participants. And of course, this is also a testimony to the quality and attractiveness that we have in our speaker today. We're very pleased to have uh, European uh, Executive Vice President Timmermans, who will be our keynote speaker today. And of course, welcome, uh, Franz, to, uh, to the talk. And uh, Franz Timmermans doesn't need any introduction. He is very well known. But it is worth recalling that um, his career, entire career has been in public service, first of all, um, as an official, then as a diplomat, um, and then later as a politician, uh, part of the uh, Dutch uh, Labour Party. And he really gained international uh, recognition and fame first was a very, very famous and moving speech at the United Nations six years ago, and more recently as the first vice president um, of the in the Juncker Commission. Most notably, of course, he's a he's a polyglot. He's, in my view, also probably the most eloquent, you know, commissioner. And most importantly, he is also very passionate about the subject that he's talking about and certainly about the subject that he's in charge of in this commission since about almost a year ago now, the European Green Deal. There are many actually aspects and policies in this and strategies that are part of European Green Deal that are of core importance for our sector, um, farm to fork, uh, the chemical strategy, the circular economy, to name just but a few. So we are very engaged. Um, the European Green Deal will have a lot of impact uh, on more sustainable production and consumption. We definitely as a sector want to be part of it. Uh, leading retail and wholesale companies have taken initiatives in that regard. And so we're keen to hear from you how we can help, uh, how you see uh, the European Green Deal and its sub-strategies having an impact and where and where we can contribute to the uh, to the strategy. We will, as usual, um, hear from you, uh, you know, take some, some keynote, uh, some key uh, remarks from, from you, and then we'll be followed by some questions um, uh, by the audience. We've had many very interesting questions from the participants already in advance. And my colleague, uh, Isabel Morizi, who is our uh, you know, head of um, uh, environment and sustainability at Eurocommerce, will be curating those questions for you. So welcome, Isabel. And now the floor is yours, Franz. Well, thank you very much. And I, I really welcome this opportunity to talk to you today. Um, you know, your sector has been so, so hard hit uh, by the COVID crisis. Um, uh, we can see this on a daily basis, all these shops closed and all our lives disrupted uh, by this pandemic. Uh, and it comes on top of uh, an industrial revolution that's ongoing, that's going to affect all of us and especially also your sector. It's uh, part of a, a big development uh, uh, of uh, a society that needs to become sustainable. Uh, we need to address the climate crisis. We need to address the biodiversity crisis. And I think there's a strong feeling in society that we start, need to start moving in that same direction. Now, the only thing we can do is to combine these challenges and to turn these challenges collectively in a holistic way into an opportunity. 
Uh, we were put in this, into this position because of, I think, a historic decision of the European Council in July to mobilize a pan-European solidarity to allow us to invest in our societies and our economies to come out of uh, the crisis we're in now. Now, of course, the second wave uh, of the COVID pandemic is uh, a huge blow to you, uh, but to all of us. Uh, we need to make sure we stay the course, we take the right direction. I'm encouraged by continued public support for the Green Deal as our growth uh, strategy. I'm encouraged by what I'm seeing coming from member states in terms of the recovery plans, which do take into account that 37% of the expenditure in the uh, rapid in, in the recovery should be on climate and 20% on digital. I do see a strong response also in the private sector uh, and especially also in your sector uh, to this. But I do understand that especially if you run a small or medium-sized enterprise, that these long-term goals we have can only be achieved if we also have short-term results. And the big question will be, for this year and the years to come, can we combine our long-term goals of becoming the first climate-neutral uh, continent in 2050 with short-term results in terms of employment, in terms of economic growth, in terms of restructuring, of our sectors uh, in terms of reskilling many of the people we will desperately need in the economy of the future but who are not today uh, who do not today possess the skill sets they will need in the future so these are some of the challenges we see the retail sector is going to be of extreme importance all of this you uh, you know if, if people start um, uh, behaving differently in the consumption patterns you're the first to notice but you're also the ones who can help people change their consumption patterns. And as somebody who visits regularly um, uh, retail, as most of us do, I see this is already already happening. Uh, but it's a bit easier for people in very, very big corporations. It's a lot more difficult uh, for many SMEs who are thinking about next month how to keep their em uh, employees on board and how to keep their businesses uh, afloat. The Commission wants to be on your side. We want to listen to you. Uh, if we make mistakes, tell us immediately and we'll try and correct them uh, to the best of our abilities. Uh, if we need to work together on certain issues, I'm there for you. Uh, as are many, many of my colleagues, and I'm, I'm sure you know this, the Commission as a whole is at your uh, disposal. Uh, let's make this recovery a success. It's going to be tough enough on everyone, but let's make it a success that also takes us into the future, thinking of the well-being of our planet, uh, but especially of humanity, of our children and grandchildren. And uh, any specific subjects you want me to explore, I'm at your disposal and I give back over to you now. Thank you very much. That was uh, short and sweet. So let me first ask you a, a first question, uh, you know, maybe a more, more political nature. I'm sure you've been riveted to your um, seat on Saturday and Sunday when the announcement was made that uh, uh, Joe Biden was to the president-elect uh, of the United States uh, and of course he's made quite a number of pronouncements in terms of coming back to the Paris Agreement. Um, so perhaps a first reaction from, from you, um, you know, whether you see that as a, you know, I assume a good news, but you know, maybe some, uh, some other, you know, more, more uh, troubling issues. So I've been be interesting to see if, uh, your reaction from you or from the European Commission. We've seen, of course, the statement from Ursula von der Leyen, but be interesting in your views, particularly from a point of view of climate change um, and European Green Deal. Well, we, we all have a, a, an important rendezvous in uh, Glasgow November next year, where uh, at the COP meeting, we will have to take stock of what the world has done. And take stock of what the world still needs to do to get us uh, to the fulfillment of our promises of the Paris Agreement. Uh, now, Joe Biden has said that one of his first actions will be to return to the Paris Agreement, which uh, the Trump administration has just left. Um, and that, I think, will be a huge boost to the world uh, as a whole and will endorse the European Union's ambitions uh, to become the first climate neutral continent. And it will also give uh, long-term certainty, I think, to to uh, corporations across the world, to the private sector across the world, that we're indeed moving into that direction. I think this is good news. I think it will also stimulate the Chinese to do what is right. They, they're doing it because it's in their own interest, but they will also do it 
um, uh, with more dedication if they see this is uh, the choice major play players in the world uh, are making. Uh, so all in all, this 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 uh, gives me uh, hope that in uh, in Glasgow we can actually make some real progress on this. You know, and, and let me remind you, it's not just China that committed to to carbon neutrality by 2060. It's Japan that's just come out and committed to uh, climate neutrality by 2050. It's South Korea going in that same direction. It's South Africa saying the same thing. And it's Russia now for the first time recognizing that it has a huge challenge in terms of uh, the climate uh, crisis. So I think um, this bodes quite well for a very, very complicated year because of course uh, the crisis caused by the pandemic is going to be the one thing that will need to be handled by all of us. Um, uh, with with a huge priority and and to combine these elements is something I think uh, the Biden administration is looking forward to doing and uh, this will put us exactly on the same page uh, which I think is something that uh, could convince other parts of the world to move in the same direction as well. Thank you very much and uh, and we also I'm sure share share your enthusiasm and and and, uh, and hopes that I think they will will move in the, the right direction. Um, so Isabel, what what sort of maybe more specific question we got from uh, from our viewers, and maybe we can, Franz, if you agree to take maybe you know two or three at a at a time. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. So thank you very much for uh, for your introduction, which I think I just uh, touched upon several topics that were discussed and. Uh, and sent by the participants. And I would like to start with maybe some general questions regarding the Green Deal on, because um, we had some questions regarding implementation and enforcement. So can you please explain us how you see the commission, how you see it could uh, monitor national and EU implementation of the Green Deal in order to steer up future investment? And another type of question is regarding uh, how will you encourage stakeholders to move faster and achieve the Green Deal? So there's a bit of enforcement, carrot and stick approach. How do you do you foresee it happening? Also in frame of the um, recovery, recovery funds that were announced. This so far. Let's start here. This is this is a summary of three questions, but I can continue on on uh, on okay. on other topics there regarding the overall. Yeah, perhaps maybe on the uh, answer that, uh, that would be interesting to attack because this is quite fundamental issues of sanctions incentives. Mm. Um, I mean, you've seen, of course, also yes. the big debate already in the Parliament on the CAP reform and the, uh, you know big uh, big debate between the NGOs on the one hand, farmers' organisation on the other. So. Uh, Go ahead, Franz. Well, you know, in, in terms of the the monitor, in terms of the monitoring of of the implementation, we have seen some national plans so far, um, uh, and the national plans seem to be fully in line, to a very very large extent in line, uh, with the priorities that were set uh, in the Green Deal and which were endorsed by the European Council. So I am quite hopeful we will move in the same direction sometimes you know we will need a dialogue with the member states uh, to make sure that they do attain the percentages and that there's no greenwashing involved and that the investment do take us in in the right direction but i'm actually quite upbeat about the willingness of member states to actually move in this direction so uh, we will monitor that we will also give our um our uh, judgment uh, of the plans you know, it's not just uh, green and digital. It's also the plans uh, need to be in line with the country-specific uh, recommendations. So sometimes they will also look at to restructuring of parts of the industry or into reforms that will be needed in the member states. And we will be working on that very closely with the member states. And it's 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 not looking badly at all. It's looking rather well because member states understand we need we need to we need to create the same dynamic everywhere if we want to. Uh, safeguard, uh, let alone strengthen uh, the internal market. Now, how do we encourage uh, stakeholders to move in uh, the same direction? Well, from public authorities, there are a few things we can do. First of all, I think most importantly, we have to offer long-term predictability 
and security so that we move in a certain direction with our regulations and we don't change course every uh, couple of years uh, uh, and i think this is extremely important at this stage so we show clearly with the legislation we will be preparing for the summer of, of next year where we're going with our energy sector with our renewable energy sector with the ets uh, uh, legislation and then also in this uh, circular economy what we will be doing on plastics uh, what we will be doing on recycling etc uh, etc et these are things where we want to create long-term predictability and security so that investments can be made uh, with uh, life cycle costs uh, well calculated mm. secondly we will have to invest in uh, research and development in many areas whether it's hydrogen or whether it's batteries or whether it's uh, new packaging products uh, whether it's new technologies uh, I think uh, we will have to show clearly that we're willing to in invest in that. Then we will also have to do a lot of blending in, in financing. The renovation wave, which I'm very enthusiastic about, is going to succeed, not just if we have good plans, which we will need, by the way, but also if we can um, facilitate the access, especially of SMEs, to financing. Uh, you know, the Juncker plan already showed that this is much easier if you organize it well. Well, the renovation wave will show that this should be made even easier. And then the access to renovation of housing and, and, and buildings uh, will become uh, uh, easier and easier to finance. And then if you create the right economies of scale, uh, they will also lead to huge opportunities for European business and lower cost for consumers. So um, these are some of the measures we could take to encourage uh, our stakeholders to move in, in the right uh, direction. Um, but um, to be honest with you, many of them don't need that much encouraging because they understand which way we need uh, to go. And uh, uh, the only thing is, uh, can we take away some of the risks? Yes, we can. Uh, the European Investment Bank can do that. We, the Commission, can do that. Working together closely with member states, uh, 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 we can do that. But I think the course is is quite set. You know, there is there is uh, there is so much understanding for where we need to go, that, um, uh, you know, the, the discussion should be, how do we make sure we leave no one behind? And I would say this specifically, and I said that this morning in another conference as well, this specifically applies to SMEs, um, uh, because with the bigger corporations, it, it, it appears to be a bit easier. But with SMEs, given the dire situation many of them are in today, it's going to warrant uh, some very special attention. Thank you. No, thank you very much. I think uh, it just more indeed, uh, we have some questions regarding clearing clear mobility and some other sector that you mentioned, such as uh, the renovation way. And I think uh, what is being transparent in the question is ensuring that there is also long term certainty for um, products that are being sold uh, and bought now. Uh, both in terms of uh, ensuring that if we buy a truck now, we can enter some city center in order to deliver to um, to, to increase the quality of living and, and this kind of, of issues. Um, and uh, could you maybe elaborate on the building uh, renovation building and how you want to uh, to how would you foresee it could be integrated in the emission trading scheme? Uh, in, in such way and we can also discuss later on into how the overall green deal is linked to other uh, commission strategies such as competition and uh, and greening of the agricultural com uh, agricultural policy yes over to me again <laughs> yes. um, uh, on the on the renovation way um, again I'm extremely enthusiastic about this and so we get really good uh have very supportive reactions also from the sectors and from the member states why because i think this is the real example where you could show that you can link a long-term goal which is the uh reduction of the carbon footprint of our housing uh the energy consumption of our housing with a short-term goal which is to get our economy going again what we need to do is to find to upscale plans that are already there and very successful to adapt them to the different circumstances uh, in the different member states to bring capital together with the expertise uh, also on a, a small scale level to make these projects uh, work and to show clearly how this is going to reduce uh, uh, energy consumption and improve uh, quality uh, of uh, living. Uh, now, um, 
I think this is not just about you know solar panels and insulation materials. It's also about uh, bringing uh, uh, the most modern communication methods in, looking at uh, modern uh, forms of energy, whether it's 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 uh, um, I mentioned solar panels, but heat heat pumps and other forms of also perhaps collective energy uh, provision at a, uh, a, a local level. Uh, it's about the transport system that goes with that. Uh, there's a very, very strong wish in uh, municipalities to decarbonize public transport. Uh, and I think this should be part of a more holistic approach of how you organize transport systems in urban areas. This will need infrastructure in terms of charging infrastructure, even at the uh, uh, level of individual uh, housing, we will have to look at, uh, especially in urban areas, at uh, charging structures. It also has to do with how you build roads, uh, cycling paths, bridges, etc. Um, and and all of this uh, will create, I think, a huge opportunity for small and medium-sized enterprise. This is work you cannot delocalize; it has to happen uh, on the spot, uh, and it has an immediate uh, positive effect. Now, the question was also. Are you going to bring uh, uh, building and transport under the ETS? We're still studying that. There are some some pros and there are some reservations. I also personally have, or some uh, complications, not reservations, complications. We need to to look at. Um, we don't want uh, if we introduce, for instance, transport in in the ETS. We don't want that to deflect attention from the need. Uh, to also look at um, uh, emissions uh, and uh, emission norms. And we also don't want to create a system that is so complicated that it creates a lot of administrative burden that can be avoided. So these are certain things we still need to analyze uh, before we uh, take a decision whether we will be going in this uh, direction or not. Now, the one issue you mentioned, which is really challenging, is to make sure that Everything we do in terms of the policies we develop and the policy areas we look into is coherent and consistent with uh, our uh, Green Deal approach. This obviously applies to the common agricultural policy, and you know uh, very well that we have some challenges uh, there, given also the recent decisions uh, made in this area. Uh, but I think we can address these challenges in the, in the trilogues we will be entering soon uh, on the specific legislations. Uh, we will have huge possibilities to invest in the agricultural sector, but let's use it wisely so we take the agricultural sector into a more sustainable uh, environment. If we, you know, the eco schemes will be of extreme importance, uh, different forms of land use will be of extreme importance. We have to re establish the health of peatlands, of forests, of grasslands uh, to also be uh, functioning as carbon sink. And we have to make sure that. Uh, the uh, clear wish of our citizens that they would buy healthier foods, eat healthier, uh, have healthier consumption patterns is also translated in the whole uh, value chain, starting from the production also uh, uh, leading to uh, how uh, products are packaged, uh, labeled and sold. Uh, so all of that uh, will warrant uh, our attention. This applies also to competition policy. Uh, this applies also to state aid policy. This applies to taxation uh, as far as uh, it is uh, our responsibility. Or in all these areas, we will need to create the necessary consistency so that it's all helping us to get to climate neutrality uh, in 2050. And also, again, and I can't stress this enough, provides enough uh, uh, a level of predictability uh, uh, and uh, uh, certainty uh, to those people who will need to invest in this uh, to make it happen. Uh, let me stop here. Can I perhaps, uh, you know, talk a little bit about consistency also when in relation to international trade? Um, I mean, talk about the, the, the elephant in the room. I think EU27 accounts for probably less than 10% of the emissions worldwide and the rest of the world for 91%. The Commission very ambitiously has come up with, you know, leveling the playing field with the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, there's been a lot of uh, um, skepticism about uh, the feasibility, the WTO compatibility with such measures. Can you elaborate a little bit about that and how you looked at this and how you plan to uh, to tackle that? Of course, this is a, a an extremely complicated issue, uh, also from a technical point of view. Um, 
the the principle is the following uh, those countries who have committed to the paris agreement will have to show that they take the measures that will take us into uh, fulfilling of the Paris Agreement. That's exactly what the European Union is doing. If other state members, uh, not member states, if other states uh, and global players uh, do the same, there is no need for us uh, to um, take measures to avert uh, carbon leakage or to <coughs> avert the risk of uh, uh, competition distortion. Uh, but if other parts of the world don't take the necessary measures, then Europe has the right to defend itself uh, and to avoid carbon leakage and to protect our industry against uh, unjust competition, unfair competition. Um, but we will have to take a sector by sector approach. Some are advocating sort of a blanket calm border adjusted mechanism. That's not going to work. We will have to look at which sectors are affected, to what extent uh, are they affected, and to what extent can you correct for that uh, situation. And so what we're doing now is looking into uh, the different sectors that, that should be or could be uh, subject to carbon border adjustment, uh, and then come up with proposals sometime next year uh, for concrete steps in that direction. But it also depends on the behavior of our international partners. You know, if, 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 if uh, Xi Jinping is serious about decarbonizing China by 2060 and then translate that into concrete measures for concrete sectors, then this will also have an effect on whether these sectors will need carbon border adjustment, yes or no. Thank you. Isabel. Uh, thank you very much. That was one of the questions that I think were pending. Um, we had some questions on the chat regarding um, uh, the next generation entering the labor market and how can they contribute successfully to reaching the long-term goals? Do you have any specific plan uh, within the Green Deal to help to upscale um, and upscale the, the sector and especially the, the retail sector because we will be accompanying the, the Green Deal uh, through different innov innovation and rely reliance maybe on digital tools? Which will have some some impact on um, on on the the, the uh, workforce, I would say. So two questions. Yeah. One is, yeah, go for it. Well, I think I think my my nightmare scenario is the following. My nightmare scenario is that uh, we uh, see this industrial revolution because that's basically what's happening, transforming uh, industries and the economy, and then we see. Uh, be also because of demographic change. Some of the European industries that grow because of that, struggling to get people uh, to fill the jobs that need to be filled. And at the same time, we see huge amounts of Europeans without a job. That is my nightmare scenario. Uh, mm -hmm. But it could happen if we don't change some of our ways. Already now, you know, it's it's sometimes so frustrating to see many parts of, of, of industry struggling to get enough people to do the jobs and at the same time see this unemployment level of young people across the European Union still at unacceptable high uh, levels, sometimes even half of the working population. So we have a problem here, which is not uh, too few jobs for too many people, which is the wrong jobs for people who don't have the qualifications to do the jobs. Uh, the jobs are wrong, but the qualifications are wrong. So we need to understand a few things. First of all, the idea that you could just get a, a qualification at young age and then for the rest of your life work on the basis of that qualification, get rid of that. We will need lifelong learning and we will adapt the, we will need to adapt the way we organize our economy to allow for lifelong learning. Secondly, we need to urgently look at our educational systems to make sure they actually provide for the skills that will be needed in a digitized uh, e economy. Now, many of these things, of course, are not in the remit of the European Union and national policies, and in some countries, even subnational policies. But we can help uh, get member states uh, to the right uh, place. Uh, for instance, in increasing the Erasmus program, for instance, in sharing experience with um, uh, vocational training, uh, which is more successful in some member states uh, than in others. For instance, also with developing educational tools and helping industry develop the tools to educate the people to do the jobs industry needs. So these are some of the things we want uh, to do in the uh, years to come, and it will very much be an element also of the 
dialogue we will have with social partners at the European level uh, to get our skills agenda uh, introduced uh, wherever we can. Thank you. Isabel. Yes. Um... Maybe going back into what the sector can do, so both retailers and wholesalers, and how can we accompany this shift? Could you, um, we, we are in a, a sector that is very visible, as you mentioned, because we, also, we are in daily contact with the consumers, and we have also shown some good practices into uh, nudging and shaping con uh, sustainable consumption partners, patterns. But, what we are facing at the moment is the fact that there is some lack of enforcement, a lack of harmonization, sometimes for certain policies. And you mentioned consistency, but also what we've mentioned we would like to have a look at is looking in the future, how can we build on what is uh, currently uh, being uh, implemented, discussed regarding the waste legislation, regarding the secular economy, and how do you see your sector helping out to reach these green goals? Well, I think you you have. I think there, your members uh, should help uh, Eurocommerce to uh, be a very active uh, player in in the impact assessment discussions we will have. Um, we we want to make sure. The legislation we develop is developed in the most cooperative way possible with the end users of the legislation, which is you. Um, uh, we've 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 paid a price in the past of not doing this uh, well enough. Uh, we need this also not just because of the design stage of the legislation, but especially also when we start negotiating uh, with um, with uh, co-legislators on uh, finding a compromise on the legislation it then remains so important that everybody who is in this trilogue business is is uh, is taken into uh, the real world uh, in terms of what the legislation actually means concretely when it is applied and i have a bit of a couple of worries there because uh, you know deciding at 27 has become so complicated that sometimes having a compromise is what everybody's striving for and then nobody's asking themselves when we translate this compromise in concrete steps is this still workable in the real world uh, and for this the impact assessment and sticking to the impact assessment and having you involved in the whole course of the way is more important than than ever before i can't stress this enough um, uh, there is so much goodwill in the retail sector and the wholesale sector to take us into this uh, a new world, uh, a sustainable world, but it also has to be made possible and uh, the legislation has to be uh, clear, it has to be transparent, it has to be applicable and it has to do, you know, the, the advantages have to outweigh the disadvantages if we want to get enough support uh, from you and from the public for what we're doing. Okay. To, to, to build a bit upon, upon that, I think I have what's one specific question when it comes to competition law, because I mean, retailers, wholesalers are very much willing to do and sometimes working together. Uh, you know very well as a Dutchman, the, the famous chicken for uh, tomorrow that was sort of turned down by the Dutch competition authorities as uh, uh, as uh, unlawful. And, um, and I know, you know, of course, uh, Margrethe Vester is working on, on trying to look at how competition uh, rules need to be uh, revised uh, in relation to the sustainability goals. So, so do you think that sustainability agreements should be example, exempt from Article 101 uh, and, and subject to what preconditions, for example, in order to provide the legal certainty and clarity for, uh, for operators that are normally competitors to try to work together on certain goals? I didn't get everything you said. Um, that was a bit scrambled, but uh, I'm not sure this is on my end or on your end. Uh, some of the words were a bit scrambled. Do you want me uh, to But that? if I got the essence, uh, well, I, I think it stays a bit scrambled. I don't know what the, whether the problem is on this side or, or not. But, can I try to jump if, in? If the essence of what you were saying is that, yes, please. yeah. 
Now, so there is a specific questions regarding um, the sustainable chicken of tomorrow example. So uh, we we've been trying the sector have been trying to to uh, have some sustainability goals to achieve, but sometimes it's been hampered. Those initiatives have been hampered by competition law preventing to get any alliances or agreements. And Mr. Van Skuren was uh, was uh, trying to to ask how you perceive it. We know that um, Mrs. Vestager is, is looking into it, but should um, sustainability issue be exempted from Article uh, 101 of the TFEU? Well, I think, frankly, that the issue of competition law of state aid is going to be addressed in a more fundamental way. Uh, mm -hmm. It should be tailored to, to uh, the world that is coming, not the world that was. Uh, and and this is not just this is not just in terms of uh, uh, the green deal. It's also in terms of Europe's capacity to create more resilience for itself. It's also in terms of what other trading partners are doing in the world. Um, you know, it shouldn't be the case that our own com competition policy weakens us in a struggle which is a global struggle. Um, uh, of course, we want multilateralism. Of course, we want to have good trade agreements, of course, um, uh, fair and free trade is to the advantage of everything, of everyone. But we need to be able to be in a position of strength when we negotiate with other parts of the world. And our competition policy and state aid policy should be tailored to that. And we're looking into this now at the Commission. I know that I'm being purposefully rather vague right now, and I am being rather vague because this is a very topical debate also within the Commission. Uh, but I just wanted to give you some of my thoughts of how we could modernize those policies uh, and in which direction this should be done. Thank you. Isabel, some further questions from our viewers. Yes, there were some discussions uh, in the um, Slido. So we have a very concrete ask uh, asked by one of the participants of having two or three, four regulatory milestones in the short term or mid term. So to see what would be the next um, priorities uh, for in, in, in view of the Green Deal journey. And maybe if you could uh, uh, also, we also have another question on the so-called plastic tax, so the EU levy um, on the EU uh, own resources, and how do you f do you feel it could help into um, deploying uh, secondary raw material and recycled uh, plastic and make it more competitive? Could you elaborate on that? Or yes, well, um, uh, let me start with the plastics uh, question, and I'll come back to the other question uh, in a moment. Uh, the, the the problem here now is is still the too big price difference between virgin plastics and recycled plastics and there are a number of technical technological uh, challenges uh, as well so i think policy should be directed towards uh, creating more level level playing field so that it becomes more interesting to recycle plastics or reuse plastics rather than always going for virgin uh, plastics um, uh, and in that in, in that in that sense, I believe we need to look at technological advancement, but also taxation will have to come in into play. You know, many of our products uh, in many of our products we don't we don't account for the carbon footprint of the product. We account for labor, we account for for investment, but very but the the, the burden on our natural environment is very often not uh, accounted for. And I think the important thing here is to create a level playing field so that competition is not distorted because we do one thing and others don't. Uh, but uh, again, uh, the goal being to make it more attractive to recycle plastics, to make it more attractive to separate waste in a better time, to make it more attractive not to have everything end in uh, incinerators uh, or in the ground, but uh, to, or exported, which is even worse. Uh, but reused and 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 recycled. But again, the challenge today is to 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 close the gap between the price of uh, uh, virgin plastics and recycled plastics. And of course, with the uh, energy prices being so low right now, it's 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 quite complicated. But that's the only uh, uh, way forward. And now I've forgotten your first question. Could you please repeat that? I didn't know for the first time. I didn't write it down. So or type it down. So please please repeat it's your first question. 
I mean, just to, to jump in, I think it's uh, not only uh, having available raw material, but having safe uh, recycled materials, which is also sure. Uh, sure. another another topic. But that's beyond the plastic tax. Um, there was a question on whether you could uh, tell us three or four regulatory milestones. Exactly. Be, uh, yeah, I remember. I remember now. So by, by the summer of, of next year, we want to have a, a revision of uh, the ETS directive. We need to look at our uh, emissions trading system, how to uh, perhaps uh, increase its scope, uh, as we discussed before, uh, look at the mechanics of it, also look at the international context. So that's what we will be doing. We will be looking at the uh, uh, renewable energy directive. We will be doing at the looking at the energy efficiency directive. So we have a number of these uh, issues. We will uh, continue be, to look at the uh, circular economy action plan and different elements there. So that's what these are very important milestones uh, for uh, the next six months, I would say. Okay, I think we have uh, maybe time for one or two more short questions and answers, and then uh, we'll have uh, to wrap up already. Isabel. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, ask a question that is close to my heart, having three kids at home, which is food waste, um, a daily struggle. How, uh, I mean, food waste is is a very interesting uh, topic for us as retailers because actually the sector only accounts for 5% of total food waste, but it is perceived as extremely responsible for it. On the other hand, when it comes to the packaging policy, it's it's a really struggle between an environmental concern about not having any plastic leakage in the environment compared to a climate concern about reducing food waste. Maybe can you please elaborate on how you see food waste policy to be integrated into the Green Deal? Of course, there is some forcing targets in a few years, but how do you expect uh, to, to tackle such uh, food waste reduction? That's a big question. You say it's a precise question. It's an incredibly complicated question because it's not just about legislation. It's also about behavioral patterns, uh, as, as you know. And uh, I think we've already moved a bit in the right direction. I think the pandemic is probably going to help us to move uh, even, uh, even faster. Um, uh, we are working on a package, as you know, uh, to be presented on this. Uh, I think it's next year, if I'm not mistaken, but I I will come back to you if I'm mistaken here. Uh, um, but the, the, the main thing here is um, to uh, get everybody involved. Uh, and this is not something I want to put on the plate of retailers. This is something that has to start with the consumers and their behavioral patterns and then you know move from there all the way down to where the food is uh, produced. Uh, and I think it starts, it, it also has to, to, to involve precision agriculture, uh, it has to involve the use of uh, of the primary resources in the production uh, 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 phase, uh, and it has to to uh, also to do with things like uh, labeling. Uh, um, you know, uh, I've all, uh, one of the things. And this might be something uh, anecdotal, but it's something that is, is something I've 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 been working for for many years. Uh, why uh, you know the, these best buy dates? Uh, People very often misinterpret them. Uh, I think many of our food products, uh, they might not be of the same uh, 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 level of quality after a certain period of time. But people assume that if you have a best, uh, uh, best buy date, that after that date, they become, they become a threat to your health, which is nonsense. And so we should reconsider uh, also uh, that sort of labeling, perhaps not put these sort of dates on products uh, that are uh, that you can maintain for a longer period of time don't need to throw away like like you know packaged rice or coffee or things like that um so there are a multitude of, of approaches we could uh, we could uh, choose um uh, and uh, i have to say that um i i am i'm really impressed by the efforts undertaken in the retail sector I think uh, most of our efforts will have to do with information of consumers and uh, changing the behavioral uh, pattern of consumers. All right. Well, I think time is up. I think we have been exchanging and talking for uh, for 45 minutes. Uh, Vice President Timmermans, many thanks to you for having engaged with us. Uh, hopefully, our viewers will see that this was a useful use of their time. I hope it really was a useful use of your time. We will Absolutely. definitely follow you, 
your uh, your suggestion and recommendations to engage with you and with your services on the many aspects and strategies uh, and not only when with the commission but also as you said when they leave the commission and go into the interinstitutional debate uh, with the parliament and the council to make sure that we have indeed proper legislation that do make a difference but that are also workable in practice you will see and of course you we often copy you also on 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 some fundamental letters that also go to other commissioner like mrs kiriakides or or Sinkevicius. Um, as the executive vice president, I think we've done so on farm to fork. We will send you this at the end of this week also a letter on the textile strategy. So you see, retail and wholesalers are very much at the customer consumer end of many uh, value chains, uh, of many ecosystems, uh, as uh, the word is now very important. So that's why uh, there's a lot of work for us, but we really appreciate that you're engaging uh, with us and that you see us as, a, as that's this important link between um you know the end of the value chains with uh, the touch point with uh, with the consumers where indeed uh, i think we get the feedback from the, from the consumer we also have an opportunity to shape it uh, and to shape their choice as well so again thank you all very much um to all of you as we really look forward to our next um uh, policy talks from eurocommerce we uh, Actually, you have at the end of November on the 26th, we have a digital lecture with uh, Huub Vermeulen, who you may know. I mean, the CEO of Gold.com, um, that will be uh, very much on the on the on some of the digital part. This is more coming from from our side and discussing some of the issues there. On December the second, we have our Jobs and Skills conference with uh, your colleague Commissioner Schmitz and hopefully also Vice President Shinas. Um, and I will have also with uh, with uh, your commissioner or uh, your colleague. Uh, Commissioner Sinkevicius uh, somewhere in January where we come back to discussing more specifically indeed environmental issue. So thank you very much for your participation. Thanks to thank all you. of you. Thanks Isabel for uh, having uh, been thank a partner in this uh, and we look forward to the next session. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.